This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. That's you, especially you, Tony Glass, Philip Less, Daniel Dorado, and brand new patrons. It's now you too, Elena, Michael, and Brian. Welcome on in. On this episode of DTNS, did Apple pull off its pivot to services? Arm faces its greatest risk, and Google lets you edit yourself right out of search. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 4th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Puff and Fluff, I'm Sarah Lane. And not too far from your nation's capital, your boy, Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. So if they did drain the swamp, it would all just flood into your neighborhood, is what you're saying. Right. I'm far enough away. Let us sway <laughs> drain the other direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, well, we have got some good stuff today. Uh, whether you're an Apple fan, a not Apple fan, or Apple ambivalent, uh, there's something for you in today's show. Let us start with the quick hits. That's the wrong one. There we go. Thursday, India announced restrictions on imports of many electronics, including laptops and tablets and servers. Companies would need a license to import such devices. So Dell, Apple and Samsung complied with the order immediately by pausing all imports. So India's deputy IT minister said on Friday, well, hold on a second. Let's give companies a transition period of at least one month so they can obtain licenses to conduct imports. I feel like India's deputy IT minister uh, never gets listened to at home and was like, wait, they actually they actually followed the rule? Hold on. Yeah. We don't one. want them to pause. We just want them to, you know, yeah. get a license. Uh, Amazon really beat the street this time, earning 65 cents a share when analysts expected it to earn 35 cents a share. Revenue rose 11 percent. Ad revenue rose 22 percent. CEO Andy Jassy said that that ad revenue growth should continue. Talked about the ramp up for Thursday night football on Prime Video this fall. Amazon sales rose 12 percent and AWS, the cloud part of Amazon, AWS sales rose 12 percent. But. That's not as fast as it has been growing. In fact, it's the third straight quarter that AWS growth has been lower than the quarter before. But Jesse has a plan for that. He wants you to know the company is working on AI, just like everybody else, telling analysts on the Amazon earnings call that every one of our teams is working on building generative AI applications. Now, most of those will be built using other companies' AI, but the key is they'll run on AWS and then they can sell them to other people to run on AWS and therefore make money on AWS. Uh, speaking of AWS, Chief Evangelist Jeff Barr announced in a blog post on February 1st, 2024, AWS will start charging for public IPv4 addresses, whether they're attached to a service or not. Barr noted that Amazon's cost to acquire an IPv4 address rose 300% over the past five years. That's just how rare IPv4 addresses are now. Uh, so he'd like y'all to adopt IPv6, if you please. <laughs> a few bits of Microsoft news today. U.S. Senator Ron Wyden sent a letter to the U.S. Department of Justice asking it to hold Microsoft accountable for negligent, negligent cybersecurity practices. The company is being called out in the wake of a major breach targeting its Azure platform last month. It affected over two dozen organizations and resulted in unauthorized access of sensitive e emails from U.S. government officials. Microsoft also shared a registry tweak. Registry tweak. Those are fun to mitigate a bug in Outlook that unexpectedly asked users to restore windows closed in a previous session. Confused some folks. And finally, good night, sweet Prince Cortana. Aww. Microsoft is shutting down the digital assistant app this month in favor of Bing Chad and other AI-powered productivity features across Windows Microsoft's been tinkering with lately um, and in the Edge browser as well. Cortana will still be available in Outlook Mobile, Teams Mobile, Microsoft Teams Display, Microsoft Teams Rooms, at least for now. But the company has also laid out plans to bring Bing Chat to the enterprise. That would be probably where something like Microsoft 365 Copilot would replace Cortana in the places it still exists. Oh, well, maybe they could use AWS. Maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't ask for IPv4 address. Uh, a new VR headset for Meta showed up in the U.S. Federal Communications Commission database. Now, the filing doesn't call it the Quest 3, but it kind of looks like one. Uh, in fact, the FCC label is in the exact same place it is on the Quest 2. Also, Meta promised it was going to share more about the Quest 3 at its Connect event, which happens September 27th. So we're getting close to needing more information about it. They said they're going to launch it in the autumn. So it's a fair bet 
that this filing is in fact the Quest 3. And if it is, well, now we know it would come with Wi-Fi 6E. Hmm. The EU's Digital Services Act requires large social media platforms to let users choose whether or not to see content recommendations that are based on tracking and profiling of their activities. In compliance with those rules, TikTok Europe announced that users in Europe will soon be able to switch off the algorithmic for you feed that TikTok is so well known for. A spokesperson for the company confirmed to Reuters that the social network is also in early stage talks to obtain a payments license in Indonesia. TikTok says an Indonesian payments license would help local creators and also sellers uh, be able to make money and get uh, some more eyeballs on the platform. Google released a tool last year to help you request the removal of personal information from search. So phone number, home address, email. An update to that just rolled out. Uh, it's called the Results About You tool, and it includes a dashboard that will alert you when such information shows up in search, so you don't have to go find it yourself. You'll be able to request removal right from the dashboard. If it's found something it thinks is, is personal information, it'll list it. You can say, yes, please remove that right away. Uh, you can get to the tool from either the Google app, just tap your profile photo and select results about you, or go to goo.gle. I had no idea GLE was a top level domain. Mm -hmm. Goo.gle slash results about you, all one word. Uh, it's available in the US now with more countries to follow. So if you're not in the US, hang in there. It's supposed to come to you shortly. Google's also expanding its policy on removal of explicit image. Now, previously, you could request the removal of non consensual explicit images of yourself, uh, but you can now request them to be removed even if they were consensual. Even if you put it up yourself, this also might apply to content you had uploaded and later removed, but uh, showed up on another site uh, without your permission. Policy does not apply to content you are commercializing yourself, though. And uh, Google's going to start blurring explicit images by default now uh, in Google search. You'll, you'll have to change the setting in, in the safe control settings. Parental controls are now searchable. You can just put in a query like Google parental controls or Google family link, and, and they'll show up right away. Um, these all seem like uh, pretty good tweaks, right? I mean, what's not to love, right? Yeah, I think this is absolutely awesome. And uh, the, my my deepest thought is, why am I still nervous to search for myself on Google? I never do this. But uh, I would hope that they bring this type of stuff more to the forefront to let people realize that this type of service is actually available to them. Um, because I, I don't know how many people actually know that I'm sure everybody knows they can search for themselves, but I don't know how many people realize that they can make requests to have information removed. You know, did you go to Google.google slash results about you? No, <laughs> uh, you don't want to know. Huh? I don't right. want to know. I, how that do you right. not search? Oh my gosh. I, I you, can't. I don't know what it is. I just, uh, there are a lot I, of things I don't look at either, you know, yeah, like the yeah. scale on the bathroom. And <laughs> but oh no, I, I immediately went and I was like, all right, let's, let's see what we can remove. There really isn't anything that, you know, all the results for, it, you know, if I search for myself. Right. Um, it's it, a lot of it's me. And a lot of it is a very well-known ballerina named Sarah Lane. Um, ah. And she and I, you know, we have nothing. We've never met, you know, whatever. But she has crawled up in the Google search rankings uh, over the years because she's, you know, really good at ballet. So some of it's me and some of it's her. And I actually just just out of curiosity. I clicked on the little, you know, hamburger menu, the dot dots next to one of her results. It was like her Instagram account that, mm. you know, is now like trending higher than mine. And, you know, it, it was, I, you, I could see, cause I was trying to think like, okay, let's think of nefarious ways that this could be abused. You know, if you're trying right. to get somebody else's result, you know, taken out so that you, right, you're right. trying to rank yourself higher, you know, it's. It's possible for me to go through it, but Google asks you a lot of questions. By the way, I did not do this to this woman, um, <laughs> but uh, but I was just say, I wanted to see how far I could get. Like, yeah, what, before you confirmed, did you really? Yeah, want to I mean, yeah, she yeah. could then you know dispute it. She could dispute it, and then I would look pretty bad, and Google would yeah, probably you know you know uh, that that would be on my record uh, if I really had an issue in the future. However, the idea of getting sensitive information, you know, the company was already doing their best to help you. Yeah. get stuff like, you know, is it my current phone number? I don't want that on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want that, uh, you know, in a, in a Google search result rather. Um, that that's all, um, 
that makes a lot of sense. Um, as does uh, sensitive material, you know, like you yeah. had laid out before, Tom. There are companies that will do this for a fee. I don't know any company that does this for free. Right. Uh, Reputation Defender is a company that gets uh, promoted on certain podcasts. So I'm just throwing that name out. I've not used them, but I know someone who has. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I know more than one person who's used more than one uh, company for a fee to get certain things scrubbed from the internet uh, because it was either uh, misleading or embarrassing or something like that. Um, whatever their reason was, it costs money. And some of that stuff feels a little predatory to me sure. because you've got a company saying, you want that photo to go away? Forever? Right. Well, it'd be you a shame out. if somebody found this photo of you. Yeah. 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 And it doesn't sound like, I mean, Google's not promising to take something down that you just don't, you know, you don't, you're not happy about, you know, yeah. we're not going to rewrite history here, but it, it doesn't cost any money. So it's a good place to start. My only downside to this, and it's a very minor thing, is that I wish Google had included the dark web search as a one stop shop service of this, um, as opposed to having it as a separate service, because mm -hmm. people should definitely get into habit. Um, a lot of password managers give you this opportunity to search the dark web to see if your accounts are on there or for any or your username or passwords are on there um, or any type of information. There's people should get in the habit of actually using these type of services to do that. So I wish they would combine those. Those two things together yeah it feels like a good feature request like yeah just just you know merge these interfaces together that's a good idea uh one last google thing here kevin tofels about chromebooks spotted a new feature turned on by default for chrome os 116 and up lacros stands for linux and chrome os and splits chrome os's linux operating system away from the Chrome browser. You may not have realized, but the browser and the, and the operating system were one because the idea was the browser was the operating system interface. Uh, Google says now that they're splitting them apart, it lets it update each one independently. So you don't have to update everything at once. They can update the browser separately from the OS. Lacros has been in development for about two years and is designed to make updating Chrome OS easier and might even extend the lifetime of old Chrome OS devices. I was mm. hoping it was pronounced lacrosse. Hmm. Let's let's change. Yeah, lacrosse for let's now. Let's just do that. Yeah, <laughs> until someone says no. We're doing it. All right. We've talked about RISC V, R I S C V before on the show. It's an open chip instruction set and it's provided royalty free. You can think of it as a competitor to what ARM does. ARM provides instruction sets and designs that companies pay to license, but RISC V provides those for nothing. So it's interesting to see that Qualcomm, NXP, Nordic, Robert Bosch and Infineon have joined forces to create a company to promote the development of RISC-V. The group plans to start with a focus on automotive applications before expanding to mobile and Internet of Things devices. The as yet unnamed company will set up shop in Germany and lobby industry associations and also governments and provide reference architectures and establish standards. They're kind of trying to do it all. This takes place... Probably not coincidentally, as SoftBank is planning to launch ARM as a public company with a stock IPO rumored for next month. Yeah, I don't think it's a mystery why Qualcomm would like to have a royalty-free version dollar, of ARM. Dollar right? bills, y'all. Oh, wait. <laughs> We're still singing cream here. Um, yeah, I always find it interesting and fun when I see these companies make these power moves to save a ton of loot, right? And uh, But at the same time, if... You know, I love competition, especially in spaces like this, because inevitably, if it's done well, you get some great features on both sides and then you can kind of choose which one suits your purposes uh, better. So, uh, you know, even though it's, you know, clearly about the money, I welcome these type of things uh, happening all the time. Now, the interesting part about it is the fact that they are releasing it first on automotive, because, you know, in the last couple of weeks, a lot of companies announced they're moving away from, you know, um, having a. Uh, iOS in the cars and stuff like that. So, um, and, you know, might be developing their own. So it would be kind of interesting to see if these, this has a faster uptake just because people are putting themselves in that position. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's perfect. It's not even greedy to say, uh, hey, it looks like ARM might raise licensing fees. They're about to IPO, which means they're going to have more pressure to show profits, which means there's more prefer pressure for them to raise licensing fees. So having a counterweight to that to keep the licensing fees from Skyrocket is just a good idea. Uh, and the fact that it's everybody, it's Qualcomm, it's NXP, it's Nordic, uh, it's Infineon means that everybody understands we're all going to benefit from this. 
uh, it's the kind of thing that if ARM is super smart, it might even join in the future at some point to kind of help form it. I doubt that's going to happen, but the, there's a route where it could that could happen in the future. Um, it's going to take a while, though. Like you say, they're starting with automotive chips uh, because that is an area where they, they, I guess they feel like they have a better chance of getting uptake. Uh, it's lower powered. It's not like servers or anything like that. So ARM's going to be fine for years. It's not like risk is going to just come in and, and take over immediately. But uh, this this is going to apply some pressure and slowly over the years, they will, just like ARM did, move from embedded systems and Internet of Things to mobile, to laptops, to servers, uh, if all goes well. Um, yeah. This is definitely something to watch, though. Yeah, for sure. Well, is there a world where ARM could join this alliance and also keep a separate, you know, specialty ARM instruction set and design part of the company yeah i don't see why not uh, yeah i mean i don't i don't really know what, why it would but uh yeah naming, i mean if there was if, if stuff there was, like that yeah 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 i, I mean, realized was, that that us saying you know arm supporting risk sounds like uh in the year 2000 saying microsoft would support linux but it yeah, does yeah, right yeah yeah right? <laughs> yeah and, so, and, you know, I could definitely see them doing a branch, you know, for specialty things and, and then joining something like this to, to move forward uh, or vice versa, using something like this for, you know, a low cost way to you know support things they don't really want to support anymore. It could go in either direction, actually. Yeah. yeah. And ARM, ARM is more than just its instruction set. It's the support. It's the design. You know, obviously, companies like Apple don't need all that stuff. They just want to license the instruction set. But uh, and, you know, that's a big chunk of change for ARM. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. However, there's all kinds of things that ARM does that if they were supporting a risk instruction set, they have talent and they have ability to do that. Um, I don't think they're going to do that anytime soon. Don't get me wrong. But um yeah, maybe ten years from now, we're like, man, remember when it was felt, sounded crazy to think of ARM supporting risk, and and now it does. Or maybe both of them will flop uh, and end up in a top five. <laughs> uh, this week on Tom's top five, Roger wrote up the top five failed home video formats you don't know about, and I count them down for you. Uh, if you're like, oh, it's Laserdisc, no, Betamax, not on it. HD DVD, no, we got bigger failures than all of those. If you want to know what they are, uh, check out the video, youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. Depending on how you look at it, Apple's latest earnings report is either bad news or great news. It's bad news if you consider that it was the third straight quarter of falling revenue, down 1.4%. And that sales of iPhones, which still make almost half of Apple's revenue, were even lower than analysts expected, falling 2.4%. So declining and declining a little faster than we thought it would. Now, the earnings report is great news if you consider that net income rose 2.3% on the year and that Apple services revenue reached an all-time high of $21 billion, just a little more than 25% of Apple's revenue, now comes from its 1 billion paid subscribers. That's three times, or I'm sorry, that's two times as many subscribers as they had three years ago. Uh, knowing the smartphone market would eventually saturate like laptops did, Apple's plan for years has been to grow services and pivot to services as its next big revenue generator. So, Chris, when you look at this, do you see good news or bad news for Apple? I, I see ridiculousness in the fact that this system exists in the first place. But <laughs> aside really from that, yeah. <laughs> um, I, honestly, I think it's actually more good news to see um, that the company's still innovating and um, and finding ways to make money uh, and, uh, and the phones aren't totally... Uh, dead for them. So I, I don't know if you, it, it, the fact that they anticipated this and didn't sit there and say, who wants a phone with just a screen on it and then do nothing about it, right? Um, they, they saw what was coming and they started pivoting and making moves much like other companies have done as well. Uh, you, you like to see that those type of things. My, my only question is, will um, this whole push to services switch up at some point and people are like, all right, I'm, I'm done with this. Just the la within the last two weeks, I canceled three services because it's just getting way out of hand. Yeah. yeah. It's not even just streaming anymore. It's everything. Everything, everything. It, it's just getting way out of hand. And, uh, and you know, I was just, I just started reassessing. I was like, 
this is too much. And even now I'm even looking at canceling more and maybe going back to just getting a basic service from my internet provider just because it's getting crazy. Um, so that, I think that's something that'll be interesting to watch. But overall, I think this is good news for Apple. Yeah, I you know, depends on how much you hate Apple. Some people are like, see, Apple couldn't sustain it. Um, it was, although the, there, there was some a dip in revenue, um, it was mostly in line with what analysts expected, slightly lower, but it wasn't like some like crazy like shock and surprise. Uh, Gene Munster, who's an Apple analyst, um, had a really good breakdown. Uh, he's bullish on Apple, but he had a, a good breakdown about um, Apple's potential in India. Uh, you know, we, we talked earlier uh, in the year about Apple opening a couple of stores. Uh, the company certainly hopes that its physical presence in India um, will be a lot more than that um, in time. Uh, Cook had noted on the earnings call uh, that the opportunity in, in India was a big deal. Um, also, he th the company didn't break out India numbers, but uh, Cook commented that India had hit a June quarter revenue record, it grew strong double digits. Um, also said the company opened, you know, noted that the two new stores um, are beating expectations. Um, so, you know, however, I don't know. <laughs> None of us have been to either of those stores. Uh, if you have, let us know what you thought about it. But it sounds like uh, there's a lot of interest there. And it, Munster also compared this to Apple uh, uh, revenue in China. It wasn't that long ago that China was an emerging market for Apple, and now it's a really big one. And uh, India has a lot of people uh, in the country. And uh, if uh, it goes into, you know, a double-digit billion-dollar revenue um, in quarters uh, to come, then then that's a bright light. Also, he mentioned, hey, we got the iPhone 15 coming next quarter, um, you know, and you got ho holiday sales and that sort of stuff. So, um so, yeah, I think yeah. that along with the Vision Pro coming next year uh, makes this conversation a year from now really interesting. Yeah, th we don't always talk about earnings reports on, on DTNS. Uh, and, and if we do, sometimes we just have them in the quick hits uh, up at the top. But Apple is one of the biggest companies in the world, not just the biggest tech companies. Uh, and their bet on services has been something that is crucial to the survival of the company. So I thought it was worth paying attention to this earnings report because it does seem like we are seeing the pivot. We are seeing the finally the, the slowing of even the iPhone. The iPhone outlasted uh, most of the rest of the smartphone market, but even the iPhone is slowing down. But services is still rising. It's a record high, but it's been a record high every quarter, which is right. good. That's what Apple wants to see. Um, so yeah, all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. As Sarah just explained, it used to be like, well, sales are, are, are slowing down for Apple, but maybe China sales can pick it up. And well, guess what? They did. So maybe India can do that. Past results are no guarantee of future results, but seems logical that that could happen. And uh, we saw laptop sales s slow down. And at a time... you. People probably don't remember when the iPhone was still so young. A lot of people are like, well, Apple can't build its entire business on the iPhone, can it? <laughs> well, it turns out it could. Uh, and it did. Uh, so that, I guess, is the bigger question. Can services be the next thing that yeah. becomes half of Apple's revenue? Well, I, I think definitely. Um, um, obviously, they have to rec recognize their revenue differently. But in the end, not only does this serve to show that Apple made the pivot uh, and it looks like they're making the right decision, but we should probably be less surprised when other companies start to continue to make this pivot. I'm, I know just within mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks, we were all pretty surprised about the announcement of some of the car companies um, kind of doing services so that you can get additional features in the vehicle. Um, and, you know, honestly, when you look at something like this, it kind of says, you know what? I should probably be less surprised that people are finding way to uh, finding ways to make services uh, a bigger part of their revenue yeah. stream. I mean, I don't love that they're trying to turn heated seats into a service, but right. I, get, I get why they're trying to do it. Yeah. And heated seats are lovely, by the way. Are they worth a monthly subscription though when they're already <laughs> in your car? Just, oh, that would make me so mad. I mean, I wow. have heated seats in the front, not the whole car, but if I if I knew they were there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, what gets you. Ooh, yeah, that would drive yeah, me well, cold. But, you know, you got to pay for that little guy to come in and light the fire under your seat. So <laughs> free, so. True. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> little green men. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. they, they, they power a lot. Uh, Mario, Mario of Super Mario Brothers, also a very powerful character. And that is why Polygon employee and writer Extina GG decided to live for a work week, five days in a row, in the shoes of Mario. And you might say, what does that mean? Well, for five days, uh, they live in New York City. They wore a full body Super Mario costume, got the mustache and everything, uh, and did things like plumbing the polygon office toilets, uh, jumping around a lot, eating Italian food, powering up with raw mushrooms. They noted they did not enjoy eating them. Uh-huh. Uh, went go-karting at Coney Island, went mini-golfing, and also danced. Typical Mario stuff, you know? Extina Mario, uh, as they called themselves uh, during this uh, experiment, tried running five miles to work the first day instead of taking the subway because that's what Mario would do, right? But then admitted that was unsustainable. But then they got creative and decided that by riding Yoshi, which in real life was a green dinosaur head on a stick <laughs> on the subway... That they could ride the subway and still feel authentic. Clever. I know. Xtina admits being Mario for a week was not easy. But you know what? We're just going to go ahead and respect their commitment to research. Fair enough. That, was, that sounds like a fun thing to do. I, I want to poo-poo and hate it. But <laughs> <laughs> this just this this took me back to a simpler time on the internet when like this kind of thing was all the rage on, on right. YouTube long before TikTok and 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 everything else. Uh, and every I, I adored this. Sun. Yeah, yeah. I, and I also I love, love that she's like a of... week meaning five days because they don't pay me to be Mario on the weekends. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. You know. It's a. Uh, yeah. Uh, Party hey, no, <laughs> What I I love the idea you know so okay like first day was running five miles to work okay we're not uh-huh. doing that so yeah, then yeah. you know second day is like how do i ride the, ride the subway but still you know mm-hmm. not just be sitting there and imagine like on tuesday seeing somebody dressed up as mario and you kind of go like oh well whatever new york city right you see them again that was my stage. exact thought it was like nobody <laughs> even paid one second of attention up there no <laughs> yes. but like what if you know because you're kind of gonna if you're commuting at the exact same time as somebody else chances are you might recognize them again yeah you know you got the same you know you're on the same schedule <laughs> <laughs> you're just and like, you're going to expect them to get off at Times Square in that outfit. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, or maybe, you know, they're right. like children's birthday party sure. or, yeah, you know, yeah. all, you know, like all sorts of things it could be. 100% um, no. chances there was at least three more Marios on the train, too. Oh, my God. You're not wrong. <laughs> and they all like yeah. had like a dance thing and then uh-huh. brought around a hat. Yeah. That right. would have been amazing if they found <laughs> another Mario and did a like head to head or Luigi. Right. That's anyway. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's get to the mailbag. Let's do it. Regarding our discussion of Warner Brothers Discovery's sports strategy for Max, Rick in Texas wanted to add to the discussion that Warner has Eurosport channels, Discovery Plus Sports and GCN Plus. Rick subscribes to GCN Plus for cycling coverage, and he says, quote, I watch most days through, though right now there's a lull for the, uh, because of the buildup to the UCI World Championships in Glasgow. Eurosport might be the ESPN for the rest of the world. Thank you, Rick. Uh, that was good Good info to add to the discussion. I always appreciate that. Indeed. We also appreciate you, Chris Ashley. Thanks for being with us today. And let folks know what you've been up to. Oh, Rod and I are getting ready to start season five of Barbecue and Tech <gasps> with some really cool food to talk about. And of course, you can always check us out on SMR Podcast, me and your boy, Rob Dunwood. I can't even call him my boy anymore. He's your boy now. It's and, our, uh, ours. <laughs> he's, right, we'll the, he's the collective the worlds. Yeah. Yes. I was say Rob's collective boy. That doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean. <laughs> he's the homie. So, yeah, we're, we're still doing our thing. But, uh, yeah, I'm so excited for this season of Barbecue and Tech. Sweet. Excellent. Uh, go and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, and uh, enough of you loved the Who Am I bit that we did with Tech Personalities last week, uh, that we're going to do it again. Uh, stick around and see if you, too, can figure out the mystery person before the final clue is given. Reminder, you can catch the show ma- live. <laughs> live or live or five? No, it's live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern at 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back Monday with Justin Robert Young and Nika Monford joining us. Have a great weekend, everyone. Talk to you soon. 
This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-hosts, Megan Maroney and Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one. BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama. Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows included Ayaz Akhtar, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Chris Ashley. And thanks to all the patrons who made the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>